Okay, well, first of all, um, I want to thank everyone so much. Thank you for such a generous introduction. Thank you to Susan Mary Grant, who was the first person who invited me here. Thank you to Umri Moir, who started off setting up the arrangement, and then to Stephanie Hideki, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Where is she? Outside. Okay. Um, who put together the logistics of getting here, and then the technical situation of getting my PowerPoint from my devices there, which, believe it or not, was a bit of an adventure. And all of this is actually very helpful to somebody who is living the absent-minded professor stereotype like myself. <laughs> um, also, thank you to the British American 19th century historians who we just had our conference up in um, Edinburgh this past week, and to the Newcastle University Insights Public Lecture Program for supporting this event. But most of all, thank you to all of you for being here tonight. I know your time is precious, and I hope to give you something of value for it. So to begin, first of all, whenever I lecture on Frederick Douglass, I'm never sure how much anyone knows about him. So if you know quite a bit about him, um, I have no intention of insulting your intelligence or of uh, boring you. You can ask me deeper questions later. And if you have very little knowledge about Frederick Douglass, except that's him and he's important, which would not differentiate you from a lot of my students, at the beginning of the semester, um, just please write it down, ask me to clarify. When you live with a figure like I have with Frederick Douglass for on and off since 2001, very closely with him, to which I call him Fred, and refer to his names like they, they're people I live with, um, you kind of lose sight of what's normal for regular people. So. Um, but I do hope that everyone does get something from what I have to say tonight. And given that a panel on Douglas here is coming up in a few weeks, that what I do is give you kind of um, an orientation to what that panel will talk about. Um, in the history of the United States, Frederick Douglass rises as one of the most important figures of the 19th century. Not black figures, but figures in general in the 19th century. His life spanned seven of its most critical decades, especially for African Americans, with himself as one of the leading players in, in the movement for black civil rights, broadly speaking. Lesser known or explored has been, at least until now, <laughs> has been his life, um, the, the role that women have played in his life, and especially at key moments on his rise to prosperity and fame. Um, these women ensured that he had the means and the ability for success, not only as a free man, but as a self-supporting head of a family who could work for the liberation and equality of his people. And while my whole book, available for purchase outside afterwards, just have to plug it. Um, can tell you more about his mother, um, represented in the upper corner. She was not a pharaoh, but he said that when he saw that picture of her, um, of this pharaoh, Ramsey, in Pritchard's Natural History of Man, that it um, reminded him very much of her. Of his wives up here, Anna in the upper corner, and Helen, the second wife, they didn't overlap despite what you read on the internet. The activist women in his life, um, Amy Post, Ellen Richardson, um, the women in this picture that was taken, actually not too far from where I live. You can learn about all of them in my book, but I would narrow our focus to the first of his three um, journeys overseas and the one that lasted from August 1845 to April 1847. That visit brought him here to Newcastle afraid that he would either return to enslavement in the United States or live out his life as an expatriate. And it sent him back home, free from his master's clutches and on his way to establishing the North Star. And as I teach my freshmen, this moment in Newcastle was one of contingency, that it could have gone one way or the other. It was a decisive moment that made the difference between him being a lesser known player in the abolition movement or a major figure in US history. What brought Douglas to England's shores was prudence, not the deal. 
Okay, eventually people of a certain age in the audience will get that joke and I'll just keep my day job. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> it was Prudence. He had just published the first of what will become three autobiographies. Narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. There are many, many editions of this out there. You can even get them online. Um, if you want a really good annotated edition, I would recommend this one by Yale University Press. Now, again, I lost my place. Okay. He had just published this first of three um, autobiographies. And in this powerful pamphlet of approximately 125 pages, Douglas indicted the system of slavery in words designed to punch readers out of complicity and answer the critics who had doubted that this eloquent, elegant, confident black man could ever have been the cringing, inarticulate, subservient slave of their imaginations. Douglas gave explicit details about his life and bondage. He began by pinpointing as closely as he could his birthplace, saying, I was born in Tuckahoe, near Hillsborough, about 12 miles from Easton and Talbot County, Maryland. With equal precision, he named his mother, Harriet Bailey, his grandmother, Betsy Bailey, several of his aunts, his first master, Aaron Anthony, his second master, Anthony's son-in-law, Thomas Ald, <coughs> Ald's wife, Lucretia, Ald's brother Hugh, who hired the young Frederick, Hugh's wife Sophia, who taught the child Frederick to read, and he even dared risk his wife Anna by naming her, although he preserved her respectability by mentioning her within the context of their wedding. In a sense, a wedding announcement. He gave the name he first went by, Frederick Bailey, the place he and Anna first went to live, New Bedford, Massachusetts on and on and on for anyone who might wish to verify his story. The only thing he did not reveal was his route north, went north when he escaped from slavery in 1838 at only 20 years old. And I thought I'd like to mention his age because it's important to remember him as a young man during the events of these papers. You all are probably about 20. Yeah, he was your age, so can you imagine? Him. Now, of course, he had been telling bits of all of this since he had first stood up to testify at a mixed race audience in Nantucket four years earlier in August 1841. Here, however, in this narrative, he gave a full accounting of the trauma he had witnessed and endured. And he published it in a form designed to reach a wider audience than those of the abolitionist events he had spoke at or the local papers in which these speeches had been published. The ramifications of publication were serious. Although Douglas, his family, and the abolitionists had considered him free since he had departed the slaveholding Maryland and Thomas Ault, United States federal law didn't agree. Legally, under the Fugitive Slave Act of the U.S. Constitution and the Fugitive, I'm sorry, that's a Fugitive Slave Clause of the U.S. Constitution, and you can look this up online, it's right in there. And only they don't use the word slave. We always like to point that out to our American students. And um, under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, Douglas was, under law, still Ald's property. And Thomas Ald could seize Douglas and dispose of him however he saw fit. And while this was not an imminent threat in the early summer of 1845, when narrative first rolled off of William Lloyd Garrison's printing press, it certainly was a potential one. So what a perfect time for a book tour. Douglas worked for the American Anti-Slavery Society, which was headed up by William Lloyd Garrison, and they're often called the Garrisonians in their brand of abolitionism called Garrisonianism. Um, I won't go into the details of that right now. You can ask later. Now, the American Anti-Slavery Society had been cultivating alliances with British abolitionists here since the 1830s and before. Black abolitionists, although they were few, were very important witnesses to garner this international support. And Douglas, this very charismatic African-American who could speak to a direct experience of slavery, he was going to be a powerful draw for an international audience 
and they would be willing to buy his narrative. So overseas, this was going to be a great opportunity for the abolitionist movement, but it would also keep Douglas safely away on a soil that would have considered him free since the 1772 Somerset case. So this 27-year-old man, he's now 27, who had been a slave only seven years older, years, seven years earlier, kissed his wife and his four children, bang, 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 daughter and three sons, goodbye, had no idea when he was going to return, and with a box of unbound copies in the narrative, he boarded the steamship Cambria, and he arrived on the docks of Liverpool at the end of 1845. And that is a depiction of his mistress teaching him how to read, or it's the de facto mistress, Thomas Auld, his master, and then of course the depictions of his mother. Now, you can follow, if you're interested in online things like this, which I totally am, um, you can follow his travels um, at the website frederickdouglasinbritain.com. And um, I believe Hannah Rose Murray, who's going to be speaking at the future panel, was very much involved in this mapping, so she can tell you more about it. Um, but if you can see, the, the little star over here is a speech he gave on the ship on the way over. And then all of these places he's spoken in, um, in uh, the UK, and I know that's kind of a tricky thing. I, I call it UK in England, in America, but in Ireland, Scotland, and Britain. And then um, up in Edinburgh, the, University, the um, National Library of Scotland, you can go see where he spoke in different places he stayed on a map in Edinburgh. This, this is like makes my heart go bad, but some people aren't quite as nerdy as me about I don't care. Be your nerd. Okay? Be your nerd. Um, so anyway, on these journeys, needless to say, Douglas had many, many adventures, several of which served to contrast American racism, that is, both Northern American racism and Southern American racism. Because as I keep telling my students, we don't just keep racism in the Southern states, in the United States. Um, as early as a voyage over, a little star over here, he encountered American anti-abolitionists and pro-slavery hecklers who objected to his white compatriots inviting him up to the first class decks to speak. He had to travel in steerage. In Dublin, he discovered from his host, Richard D. Webb, who was a Quaker who seldom varnished his opinions, that the corresponding secretary of the American Anti-Slavery Society, Mariah Weston Chapman, and that is her up there in the corner. She was a very formidable woman. They called her Garrison's Lieutenant. Well, he discovered that she had very little trust in him. He has the wisdom of a serpent, she wrote to Webb, warning the Irishman to beware that the cause has been nothing but gain to Douglas in a worldly point of view. In other words, he was profiting off of the movement. She summed up her opinion of Douglas as a man who was all that a strong mind and a strong body can make him without genius. And yet, a cunning so great as his almost amounts to genius. She wasn't a man. <laughs> when she should believe, should keep an eye on him. In contrast, elsewhere in Ireland, he earned the nickname the Black O'Connell, when he shared the stage with Daniel O'Connell, the Catholic emancipator. In Cork, way down here where the 16 is, in Cork, he was hosted by the Jennings sisters and was eventually just left there by the American Anti-Slavery Society alone with them to go tour about the countryside. They hosted him for three weeks that he lectured in the area, and the sisters, particularly Isabel Jennings, welcomed him like a brother. And he received none of the violent retribution or crude comments that would have been and would eventually become visited upon him in the United States for being a black man in company with white women as their equal. Douglas himself marveled that I find myself not treated as a color, but as a man. Throughout his journey, no white woman shrank from him, and you know, quite the opposite, much to his embarrassment. Um, one Bristol abolitionist noted that you would be surprised at how women 
catch him. And another abolitionist said, but he's always very careful to you know, mention his wife and how much he misses his wife. But now, um, so while the women are all fawning over him, no man, white man chastises him for behaving like an equal of anyone. None that is, except one. Okay. As Douglas is crisscrossing the Irish Sea and going up and down the railroads, okay, from America arrives Thomas Smythe. Thomas Smythe is that guy there. And he charges Douglas with leading a Manchester brawl. Now, the context of this is that the Free Church of Scotland is raising money. And Douglas, when he, especially when he's in the North, he's seen that a lot of these um, reform movements overlap and intersect. And the Free Church of Scotland is collecting money for poor relief. Well, Thomas Smythe, Presbyterian minister, comes over bringing money collected from Southern slaveholders. The abolitionists in the Free Church of Scotland movement are saying, we can't accept this blood money. And they start this chant, send back the money. And Douglas almost carves it into the side of, um, of the cliffs of Arthur's seat. You know, so. um, then he told by the police. Um, so Douglas is leading the chant, is amongst those leading the chant. Um, he's gaining all this. You, you can see him gaining confidence in his letters and his speeches. And um, so he starts calling Smythe the Reverend Man Stealer, owning slaves. And so Smythe decides a good way to credit, discredit the abolitionists and either force them to cut Douglas loose or discredit them as a whole is to say you know, the oldest trick in the book, especially in the American South, if he's visiting a brothel in Manchester, it's most likely white women, say he's visiting a brothel in Manchester. Say he's doing untoward, dirty things. Well, Douglas hit back. The charges were, of course, all false. Douglas, in fact, I plotted this out on the map and everything. He was nowhere near Manchester by that point. And so Douglas, he's been accused. But what he does is he files a suit against Smythe for slander. This would have been laughed out of the courts in the United States. Instead, Smythe backs off. He's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, it was like a third hand. I, I, I. So Smythe withdraws the charges. So this is a moment in which Douglas is encountering a legal system, at least in this case for him, that did not assume him guilty just because of his color. And these sorts of things are going to be a constant theme through Douglas's life, especially later in life when he marries a white woman. And then he, um, he helps Ida B. Wells, who is an anti-lynching crusader. But that's another story for another time. In fact, I think it's chapter 10. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, as he's going through this attack from Smythe and hearing these things about him, okay, yet another bit of news comes across the ocean. Now, back in October 1845, set up the timeline, back in October 1845, Right after he's arrived, he goes over to Ireland. He's traveling around with the Jennings sisters. His narrative gets into the hands of his master. Okay. And, well, the Alls, like most Southern masters, are just incensed that they've been portrayed as the villains. They're strong. We're good to our slaves. We treated him nicely. How dare he say these terrible things about us? So, Hugh Auld, the brother who lived in Baltimore, who Douglas had the most contact with, especially at the end, he's the one who Douglas ran away from. He actually hired um, Douglas, that is, didn't buy him, but paid his brother to have him work for him. Purchased Douglas from his brother Thomas Auld back in Maryland. Purchased him for $100. Um, let's get this straight. Okay, so he purchased him for $100. And then, as the news starts to drift into the abolitionist press and then overseas, 
He makes clear, he says, Hewald makes clear that if Douglas ever sets foot on, back foot back on American soil, and by this time it will be known when he sets foot back, he will take him and bring him back to slavery. All motive, Douglas believed, wasn't financial. He believed it was to feed his revenge. Not a, you know, pretty plausible reason, but also we'll see about the motive, the financial side. Now, here lies a big conundrum for Douglas. He could purchase his own freedom, but such a move was going to be anathema to the American Anti-Slavery Society, to which he belonged, and for which he was working while he's touring in England. The organization was found and headed, as I said before, by William Lloyd Garrison. And its nonviolent strategies called for immediate emancipation without compensation for owners of human property. To pay even an individual master for an individual person's freedom was recognition of that master's right to own that other person. So you don't do that. You don't recognize anyone's right. One might as well pay a ransom to a kidnapper, and indeed they often framed it as such. Now, this is all well and good for white people who are being very principled. But for Douglas, well, now he had a very real serious choice that was going to have extensive ramifications. He could return to the United States, his home, his wife Anna, his four children, all of whom miss him and whom he missed to the point of melancholy, and there are letters of him talking about being lonely and missing his dear Anna. But he would face certain recapture from the moment he set foot on American soil. <laughs> this would jeopardize not only his personal future and physical well-being, but theirs as well. He'd be leaving Anna, a single mother with children in a working class. You know, four children in the working class, and they're all like two years apart. Or he could stay in England, which meant uprooting Anna for the third time since they were married in 1838, taking her across the ocean and setting her down in a foreign land. And in fact, a certain amount of negotiations seemed to be taking place between the two of them during this time. This would be through the summer of 1846. And while supporters in London were raising the English equivalent of $500 to bring the Douglas family over. Okay. So this was a very real possibility. But Douglas, this is, you know, this is not sitting well with it. And he's pondering the fate of other black men, men who he had been in the campaign to hold in freedom as they were returned to the South. And he mourned his even his own home state, Massachusetts, which was supposed to be this bastion of freedom where everyone would protect the slave who had taken his own liberty. And he just, he was in despair. And he wrote, I have nearly lost all confidence in honesty, fidelity, and love of liberty. Home seemed not to be an option for him to return to, and exile seemed like a harsh and lonely choice that he would also be foisting on his family. And then, he met the Richardsons, and that's Anna Richardson up there. Okay. On August 3rd, 1846, almost a year after he left home, he arrived in Newcastle, greeted by Ellen Richardson, someone he called a clever lady, remarkable for her devotion to every good work. And you can read the... Um, correspondence of all of the abolitionists, and they held her in very, very high esteem. And she was here with her sister-in-law, Anna, Anna's cousin, Anne, and Ellen co Ellen's cousins, the sisters, Eliza Nicholson, who was also held very high respect, and Jane Carr. Now, all of these women who were involved in a lot of reform movements, they had been involved in anti-slavery since the 1830s, and they had extended familial connections to the Jennings back in Cork, the Wiggums in Edinburgh, and the Sneals in Gap, Glasgow, each of whom had welcomed Douglas and whom Douglas had stayed with when he visited those cities. Now, the way I imagine the situation, and I just went over there yesterday, and I believe somebody in the audience I ran into in the streets. Um, we were walking over there yesterday, and I was imagining it has the marker at the Richardson's house on Summerhill Road. I say that like I know this. Um, 
And um, there's a bay window right next to the door, and I'm imagining what if that was a parlor, and all of this was going down right there in that parlor. They'd be sitting there, and he was always very, he was much more effusive and open and relaxed in the company of women. And you can sometimes see even two letters, one written to a wife, one written to a husband, about the same subject. But he's, he's almost flirty and friendly and relaxed when he's writing about her. It's all very business writing to him. It's also quite true about women's letters anyway. But he, um, I can see him sitting there and just kind of pouring his heart out about, there's this guy, and he's accusing me of this, and now I can't know if I can go home to my wife, and what are we going to do? And you know, just all of the weight of the world hanging on him. Okay. So they hear his story, and they decided, you know, the simplest solution, pay the pocket price of his freedom and present it to him as a done deal. Okay. And accordingly, and it seems without Douglas's knowledge, they engaged agents who contacted Hugh Auld's agents back in the United States. And Hugh Auld, he set the price at um, 150 pounds. That was the equivalent of $711.44 at the time. Um, I don't know how it would translate to date, but I know that in dollar, in recent pounds, but in dollars, that would be $24,000 today. Now remember, he purchased Douglas from his brother for $100. Now he's asking for the equivalent of $711. Okay. So that means he is going to be getting a substantial return on his investment. So throughout October, the Richardsons and the women in this area in Newcastle started to raise money, and they got 70 pounds together. And then Jane Carr's brother-in-law started to collect at a meeting in Edinburgh at the end of October, and he collected 80 pounds, which was the difference. And then they sent it all over, all with his substantial return on the $100 investment, signed the manumission papers on the 5th of December, 1846, and in January, 1847, Douglas was a free man. That is legally free. Now, to the Richardsons and other donors, the exchange seemed a very reasonable means of preventing a horrible, horrible injustice. And they would repeat this sort of an exchange five years later with the um, fugitive slave William Wells Brown. Okay. This was very much in keeping with the way Britain had emancipated its slaves. The 1833 West Indian Emancipation Bill offered 20 million pounds sterling in compensation to slaveholders. And while the Richardsons and their colleagues had no qualms about this transaction, I mean, they were Garrisonians, they were Quakers, but they were willing to do this. Those of the more doctrinaire Garrisonian mind, in the words of Esther Sturge of London, and I apologize, I like to do accents, if this is a really bad accent, I'm American. Okay, Esther Sturge, Esther Sturge said, a compromise of the great principle that all men have a right to be free. And Mary Welch in Edinburgh insisted, some of us have been very much grieved at Anna Richardson getting that money collected to purchase Frederick Douglass's ransom. <coughs> and Sturge and her circle would contribute neither funds nor letters on the Richardson's behalf. Although Sturge insisted that we do not feel less interested in Douglas's welfare. American abolitionists also condemned the exchange. After all, argued one Pennsylvania society, all could only use the price of Douglas's freedom in the purchase and rearing of other slaves for the market. Henry C. Wright, an American abolitionist who had traveled with Douglas several times, turned directly to Douglas, advising that you will be shorn of your strength. You will sink in your own estimation if you accept that detestable certificate of your freedom, the blasphemous forgery, that accursed bill of sale of your body and soul, or even, by your silence, acknowledge its validity. <coughs> Tell us how you really feel, Mr. Wright. <laughs> Ironically, the one Garrisonian who didn't condemn the business was William Lloyd Garrison himself. 
At that Edinburgh meeting, in which they raised the difference of the, the final sum for his purchase of his freedom, Garrison declared that he seconded with all my own heart the motion of the ransom of Douglas from bondage. He acknowledged that, sure, he contradicted his own ideology, but in Douglas's case, he would submit to being robbed that one so loved should go free. Actually, I've been pretty harsh on Garrison throughout the book, but this was a one stand-up moment of him. Douglas himself very much understood the objections, but he considered my liberty of more value than 150 pounds sterling and the happiness and repose of my family worth more than paltry gold. Recognizing the authority of the law over him did not mean that he condoned it. The price was paid not to establish my natural right to freedom, but to release me from all legal liabilities to slavery. He was a free man. Pay the money, fine, whatever. He was always a free man. For all that his nation's institutions seemed to decline to deny his claim to citizenship and even his very humanity, my sphere of usefulness is in the United States. My public and domestic duties are there, and it seems my duty to go. Legal freedom would make his life much easier, and more so only three years later when the US Congress passed the notorious Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. Then, he would end up helping many more find legal freedom, even if only in exile in Canada. And his voice would serve a greater purpose than its himself had followed them. Now, Douglas learned of his liberation from all its clutches in January 1847. He was visiting the two architects of his legal, two of the architects of his legal freedom, Jane Carr and Eliza Nicholson, who again are related to the Richardsons. Now they asked him about his future, and reflecting on the past few years and the coming years, he revealed his ambition to operate an abolitionist newspaper. For some time, he had been adding journalism to his um, repertoire, sending regular columns to the Liberator from overseas. And some of these are incredibly powerful, especially, especially when he wrote from Ireland, where he talks about touring Ireland. And no one called him the N-word anywhere. And it's a very powerful um, way of deploying that word in a, a, a harsh condemnation of American racism in contrast to what he's experiencing overseas. Now, okay, he's added these columns to the Liberator. He's also witnessed the effects of narrative on a wider audience that people have gotten hold of his narrative, read it, and now they're meeting him. How exciting that is. Um, and away from home for most of the past five years, he had been absent from many major family decisions and suffering the physical toll and even danger, constant travel and duration had taken on him. He, he was at one meeting when he was away from home and he got attacked and it broke his hand. And he had pain riding with that hand for, a long, for the rest of his life. Okay. He longed for a more sedentary life, but one that didn't acquire, require him to abandon his influence on the anti-slavery movement. As observed Jane, oh, by Jane Wiggum of Edinburgh, whose father had issued the call for the donations to round out the price of his freedom, Douglas had and almost wished to provide for his own family while he is pleading for the whole family of men. Editing a newspaper seemed the ideal solution, with Carr, who was related to the Williams, as treasurer, and Mary Eslin, Mary Brady, and the Richardsons among the many coordinators. A campaign began to purchase a steam printing press, or at least to donate to him to purchase it when he got back to the United States, which was going to be the costliest investment for such a venture. And I looked for, that's what a steam printing press looks like. And it's a pretty big deal, I think. Um, and this is supposed to be a picture of what his North Star office looked like, published in the Rochester newspaper. Maybe, maybe not. It, it, some artistic license might be taken. <clears throat> now, down in London, one of those coordinators was publisher Mary Howitt. And among her most enthusiastic fundraisers was a woman named Julia Griffiths. 
Julia Griffiths later became instrumental in ensuring the survival of Douglas's paper when the North Star nearly failed in 1849. But that is another story for another time, and I'll be very happy to answer questions about that. Meanwhile, <coughs> I'll wrap it all up. In April 1847, when Douglas rushed back to his family in Lynn, Massachusetts, with Anna surprised, but nonetheless pleased, to greet him. He stood poised to take the next crucial step. He had departed America's shores, an employee of the American Anti-Slavery Society, which kept him from home for ever longer periods of time. This last went overseas for a year and a half and required him to espouse their ideology with very little movement, and now he's been exposed to other ideas. He was one man's voice and still fugitive under the law. But now he's returned, having experienced land not only free from slavery, but also of the same kind of configurations of racism as in the United States. He had traveled among people, sometimes without Americans, who presented him with both the legal freedom that liberated him from the threat of recapture, which enabled him to assume a national mantle and with the funds to begin his own newspaper, which would give him the platform to develop his own voice, a means to cultivate other writers and debates, and to train young African-American men, including ultimately his own sons, in a trade. Okay. The survival of this paper, which would come through the connections he makes here in England, because of course they are gonna be some of the major subscribers to this paper, enabled him then to support his own family and to evolve his own abolitionist strategies and to project the model of a self-reliant black man, something that white American racism didn't think was possible. So for Douglas, the way I see it, liberation was not a single event. It wasn't him running away or even just his purchase. Liberation became a life's work. And by 1846, it was literary, learning how to read, it was literacy, it was physical resistance, that is when you read his narrative, he fights back against his master. It was escape from bondage when he runs away. It was forming his family, getting married and having his children, all of whom he could protect. It was this abolitionist activism that now allowed him to speak out on behalf of other people like himself. And then when all threatened this process of liberation, the women Douglas met in England, Scotland, and Ireland not only protected the freedom through its legal purchase, but gave him the material to continue this process of liberation. And thus, we come to our end. So thank you very much. Um, but he's traveling amongst the Protestants there. Um, and uh, he's there in Cork, which was going to be kind of ground zero for all of the immigration, um, right just as the famine is hitting. 
and then the fallout from that. And a lot of their activity gets taken from there. But they're related to the webs, and the webs are related to the Richardson. And so there, it's, there's all of these connections via family, religion, and um, interest in reform. And um, I, don't know who's, I know there's people who have done a lot of research in this that can give you more localized and specific connections. But um, that's the most I can tell you about it. Oh, so that, who's going to get to that? Who's going to get to that? Can you wait till we wait so everyone can hear the question? Sorry. I didn't see. Sorry. Oh, she's coming. Sorry. Related to that, uh, I mean, my understanding is that these families were particularly uh, of a group because of the developing industry in mm -hmm. the Northeast here. What about the attitude of their husbands and the male establishment? Newcastle, for example. Do you have anything to say about that? I have nothing to say about that. They're men. I'm not interested. In <laughs> I don't know. I don't know a whole lot about. I mean, I was kind of. It was, it, there's a point where you're going. How deep should I go here before I can't come back? And um, and I didn't go quite that deep. But the men are also involved in the anti-slavery movement and are supporting their um, they're supporting their wives. I know in the Ameri on the American side, quite often what happens is the husband has the job, he's interested in supporting, so he support he's interested in the movement and does a lot of business with the movement and supporting the movement. But it's the women who are doing a lot of the nitty gritty stuff in the movement. They, um, the men may kind of create the big structures and be members of the big societies, but the women are in there raising the money and um, getting the halls reserved and doing all of the all the logistics, the, the, the stuff that people don't find interesting because it's not getting fiery speeches um, or leading up organizations, but they're in there making sure it happens. Pain had gained his freedom, or his freedom, freedom had get, been given to him. But what happened to his family? Presumably, they were still slaves. Actually, no. Oh, oh, wait, wait, which, 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 well, which, oh, what I mean is which family, his wife and children, or his family back in slavery, like his sisters and brothers? In, in, in America, is that his family that he left behind? Okay, his wife was actually free. She was born free. So, legally, she's still, she's free, and their children, by the way, the status followed the mother, were free. His mother was dead by this time. His mother died when he was about nine. His grandmother probably died about 1845, but he writes to his master. He doesn't know. He writes to his master, and he writes two letters on the anniversary, one on the 10th anniversary and one on the 11th anniversary of his um, running away to his master, asking, do you have my grandmother? She's going to be elderly now. Of what use is she to you? Send her to me. And of course, he doesn't get an answer back. Um, his, the, his, one of his sisters was free because her husband purchased her freedom. But he really didn't know where most of his family was because he had been taken away. They had all been slaves on, down in the rural area of Maryland. And then they had been split up when his first master died. They had split up amongst the, um, the heirs. And then he was sent to Baltimore. And he spent the majority of his life in Baltimore, most of his teen years in Baltimore, so he was alienated from most of his extended family. So he didn't know a whole lot about them, and getting information about them was going to be very difficult. Um, after the Civil War, though, he starts to reunite with them. And his brother, Perry, he writes to Douglas after the Civil War from Texas, no less. And um, Douglas brings Perry's family up to live with him. And Perry, um, Perry ultimately died at Douglas's house. He had been so worn out and then got tuberculosis and he died. And so Douglas was, um, in the end of his life, when he was after emancipation, was doing what he could, his own kind of form of reparations in a way. Um, it's almost like survivor's guilt in a way, but also this sense of deep responsibility. He was the one who got out, so he should help his extended family whenever they needed help to get on up in the world.
заявление вас не выживает. Well, how did he finance his um, passage to um, Ireland and England, the UK? Well, how, how, how did he go under the radar when he was enslaved? Oh, sorry. Um, well, first of all, <laughs> how he was able to go under the radar was his name, in slavery, he was known as Frederick Bailey. And then he changed his names a few times, like from Maryland up to New York, and finally settled on Douglas with two S's. And, um, when, when he starts to become famous, he's Frederick Douglass. And so he could have gone about just making general gestures to be having experience of slavery and gone through the anti-slavery movement um, as Frederick Douglass. But when he publishes a narrative and people question, were you really a slave? How could you possibly have been a slave? You're too nice looking, you're too well spoken. No way. So he, he writes, that's why he makes all those very specific names, naming names, naming places, naming what he can, when things happened. And um, then when that becomes publicly known, then he's at risk. And um, he's working for the American Anti-Slavery Society. So they're the ones, I mean, it's, it's, this is one thing that a lot of people are, are surprised about. It's a job. You know, it's, it's not just I'm doing it for, you know, it's a job. And not a very well paying job either. So they pay for him to come over on this tour. Um, they raise the money for him to travel on the Cambria, which is part of why he's in steerage too. And he um, and they're they're sending him to people who help pay for him. And then he's got his narrative, which he's also selling, which is also helping fund his tour. So that's how he's he's able to do that. Could you tell us about his second marriage? Oh, sure. <laughs> More than you want to know. <laughs> okay, his first wife, um, Anna, who's actually a little older than him, what her birthday year is is kind of. Actually, this is what's interesting is when you're studying black women. Quite often, you can find more, at least, demographic information about enslaved women than you can about free women because, well, somebody's interested in certain demographic information about them because they're property. So she dies. She's a little older than him, and she dies in 1882. Okay. Um, stroke. Very important. He's broken up about this. He, you know, heartbroken. Mother was the post in the center of our, my house, and now she's gone. And his grandchildren witness him crying because she's dead, and then they're crying, and it's very affecting. But um, he goes into a deep melancholy for a while afterwards, and then um, you know, I don't want to say he got over it because you don't get over it that. But when he's able to move into the next stage of his life, there's a woman um, who's working in his office. And they've been friends. He had known her family since she was 15. She's the same age as his daughter. Again, this is not like she's 16. She's 40-something years old at this point. Um, and she's one of the, uh, the copyists in his office, which in those days, um, if you look on the internet, they'll say she's a secretary. But she was a copyist, which is, well, Xerox machine, you know, a copying machine for the women. And, um, her uncle lived next door to him in Washington, D.C., and they had known each other, and, um, and you know, they started dating and they got married. Actually, they, they got married. They surprised everybody by getting married. But um, the thing, you know, everybody, all of the historians who wrote about this, all they focused on was that she was white and she was educated because she went to Mount Holyoke College. But they didn't know much about her beyond that. And, they were all just assuming, of course he'd marry her because she's white and well educated. And of course he she'd marry him because he's Frederick Douglass, and who would say that Frederick Douglass? But when I started to dig into her life, she um, she was educated, but during the Civil War, she went to work for an organization called the American Missionary Association. And they were before the Freedmen's Bureau, which was a federal agency, they were the first group to send in really large numbers Freedmen's aid to the, the former slaves. And so she went down and she taught schools um, in Norfolk, Virginia, which was pretty much ground zero for emancipation. 
And she taught school, she taught something like 500 students in the morning, another 500 students in the afternoon, I mean a different set of 500 students in the afternoon, um, six days a week, and then Sabbath schools on Sundays, which would be 500 students. And these were all ages, because these are all people running from the countryside, from slavery, and they want to learn to read and direct. And so when I got into all of this about, oh, no wonder he was attracted to her. She committed her life to something as well, and it ruined her health. Like, it ruined most of the teachers' health, most of the relief workers' health, going down just in these cities that are being taxed by the number of people coming in, sitting in rooms, you know, people are coughing. I mean, if you're a teacher, you usually get sick in the first semester. <laughs> and so it's multiply that by no antibiotics or vaccines. And so, um, so you know, she had had this background, and then she moves, you know, in her 30s, 40s to Washington, D.C. She's involved in her film um, group there, and then she gets, you know, so she's one of these single women who are making a living in Washington, D.C. in the bureaucracy, and so they got married. And then she was by his side the whole time. I mean, she took, they both took a beating for, um, not a literal meeting, but in, amongst friends in the press for marrying each other. But her father cut her out of his will. One of her sisters would not even tell her children about their marriage. So she gave up a lot in marrying him, and um, because of her, she outlived him because she was younger. And, um, I mean, they traveled Europe together. But she outlived him, and because of her, most of his papers, when he willed the house that they were living in, Cedar Hill, and his library and papers to her. Now, this was a more complicated story, but it's in the afterword. <laughs> um, but what it comes down to is there was no house, the house museums at the time were, very, were not very, you know, they weren't widespread. So she looks to George Washington's Mount Vernon as a model, and she decides she's going to do the same thing with Douglas's house. And so because of that, you can now go visit that house, and you can research in his papers. So she preserved all of this for posterity. Against a lot of odds, too. <laughs> so that's her, Helen Fitz. There's um, a gentleman there in the middle. Can you? Uh, in one of the streets which runs off Ranger Street, there's a plaque on the wall with Douglas's name on it along with uh, Gary Bowley, and I've forgotten somebody else. <laughs> I've forgotten. I think it's William, William Lloyd Garrison. Sorry? William Lloyd Garrison. William Garrison, right. We missed it. Well, I'll take you there. <laughs> I mean, the, one of the, the kind of libertarian voices in the town was Joseph Cowan around the Evening Chronicle, which is a local paper, so it's just, I mean, I know that Cowan was a bit of a bad boy in ways. He sent rifles off to the from Garibaldi's activities and everything. But did he have much to do with, with uh, Douglas? Uh... I have no idea. No idea, right? I uh, wish I did. That, that, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they, like, at least knew of each other. Well, there was a very strong libertarian movement in, in the town in those days. Led, led used by, voiced by Joseph Cowan, who were around the local newspaper. Mm -hmm. oh. I mean, the name sounds like I know it from a footnote. Yeah. And so... Well, I mean, it was quite a problem. Oh, well, they, they, they're yeah. an idiot in some ways. I mean, it's a statue to him somewhere. Yeah. And he, he did like to, I mean, he, he gravitated towards newspaper people who were familiar with, you know, yeah, who were... That's what I was saying, when he said he was running a newspaper, he had a newspaper yeah. built in here, yeah? Yeah. Right. Okay. Oh, goodness, there's a flurry. Okay, so do you want to start with the lady at the back? We'll work our way down. The lady and the gentleman and the gentleman in there. Do have a couple of them? Here's a person who's 20 years old, a slave. Wait, where am I? Where am I looking? Who taught him to read and write? Well, um, his, the Mr. Sophia Alt. Um, his, his master, his master, okay, just to, it was, to make a long story short because of all of the, the 
details of who she was to him. Essentially, she was his mistress, Sophia Hall. And when she, he arrived as, he was like six or seven when she, he arrives on her doorstep, he's supposed to be the, um, the babysitter, essentially, of her young son, because she's expecting another baby. And so um, she, he watches her reading from the Bible. And I think the Bible is kind of the key thing here. But he's watching her reading from the Bible. She's Methodist. And um, so it, it, he says, I want to do that. And so she starts to teach him his ABCs. And then when um, she, she's proud of what she's done, I taught, I taught the little boy to read. Look, I taught him. And so he gets up and he performs for the master, Thomas R. Hewald. And he goes, God, what have you done? You teach him to read, he'll never be fit to be a slave. Stop it. So she stopped. And then she went like fully in the other direction. And so he goes into great detail about this in My Bondage and My Freedom, his second autobiography. Um, and, but he, he says that when he saw that the master said this was a thing you don't want to teach him to do, he knew that this was a thing you wanted to do. <laughs> and, um, and so he starts to try to find other ways to learn to read. Um, and he goes in his autobiography, he talks about different techniques. But he's now learned his ABCs. Um, he uses the little boy as he gets older. Um, he uses the boys' copy books that he only had in school. He falls in with free black community in Baltimore who are teaching themselves to read. And so he uses that. He tricks boys on the docks in Baltimore, white boys and Irish boys on the docks, um, to teach him how to write. And so he purloins his, his literacy in a lot of different ways. And he's constantly learning. Like his process of liberation is constant. Um, is ongoing. His, his education, because this is a man whose mind is just sucking everything in. So even when we first meet him as a, you know, in the documents, he's still teaching himself learning to read. He's still wanting to learn how do I spell better, which is something I can relate to. Um, he's wanting to learn how to form his sentences better. He wants to read more books. He wants to learn how to present himself better. So it's an ongoing process that started when he was a little boy who said, I want to be able to do that, and then had to steal all of his education. So very much an autodidact. Was it the gentleman? Yeah, gentleman. Yeah, you got it. Uh, uh, I'm just following up on that gentleman before, just about places of interest as well. Uh, I wonder if you're aware of in also Benjamin Gore in Gita, where in um, Frederick, Frederick Douglass visited as well with the Spencer Watson family who stayed there as well. So yeah, there's papers there as well. Visit there. I'll have to come back. <laughs> I think we'll probably have to um, drop to close. So that thank you very much. Lee's got time to answer any questions besides her book. But I think there's a lot to think about. I think there's a lot of research projects um, for you, Brian, to your students do. Thank you so much. You must well, so thank much you. Thank you for you coming you know, to Newcastle. It's a real privilege. So can I just thank you. Thank you. Thank you.